Now, if you haven't seen part one, you should, because you will probably be lost. And I also kind of need those views, so go ahead and watch part one. But in part one, I talked about the origins of the modern Kurdistan conflict, talking about the interwar period, talking about the post-World War II and the World War II periods, covering the conflict mostly within Iran, Syria, and Iraq, all the way up to the Iran-Iraq war. Now, if you want the details and not to be lost, watch part one as part two will mostly and heavily be talking about the PKK Turkish conflict and then we'll just segue that into the modern Kurdish struggle. I bought this book, I read the whole thing, and damn it, I'm using it to make a video. If we're being brutally honest, this video is kind of just a PKK Turkish conflict video with some other things tossed in. Big surprise here, but our story will begin in the 60s in Turkey where Turkey was dealing with political and economic turmoil within the 60s and then political violence within the 70s. During these years of political instability and later on violence during the 60s and 70s, mostly between far right and far left groups, you would begin to see Kurds publicly adopt aspects of Kurdish culture and language as a way of showing protest to the Turkish government policy towards Kurds. Then also during the 1960s, many Kurds would begin to join these far left Turkish groups as, like from part one, a lot of Kurds living in urban areas were exposed to leftist ideas and tended to be open to leftist ideas. And to put it very frankly at times was just a better option compared to the ultra-nationalistic far-right Turkish groups who simply viewed Kurds as mountain Turks. That being said, as the 60s and later on 70s went on, many leftist Kurds would feel that the Turkish far-left groups were at times ignoring, were ignorant or oblivious to issues that Kurds specifically face within Turkey. By the 1970s, political violence would break out between far-left and far-right groups within Turkey. Guerrilla warfare would break out, street warfare would break out, kidnappings would begin, bombings would be committed, colleges and universities would become war zones and political massacres would grip the country. Even the Turkish government would find itself paralyzed by these political divisions and could only watch the violence, you know, break out. In 1971, the Turkish military would lead a coup in the name of halting political violence. And during the 1970s, the Turkish government would begin to arrest leftist leaders. Kurdish leaders and began to shut down these leftists and Kurdish groups. One of these Kurds that went to protest the military coup was a man called Abdullah Öcalan. He would be arrested in 1972 while protesting the military coup. While in jail, Abdullah Öcalan would begin to form his ideas on what should Kurds do within Turkey. Even with the military coup and political violence and massacres and all that still gripping Turkey, Turkey would have elections in 1973. The new Turkish government would also declare a general amnesty for many political dissidents that were wanted by the Turkish state or military. Many exiled leftists and Kurds would then return to Turkey, where they would then begin to create new leftist groups. But also during this time, many political leftist Kurds would begin to look towards the idea of national liberation. Kurds within Turkey's leftist movements would begin to see a shift. The ideas of Kurdish self-determination and slash or a wider acceptance of Kurdish identity and culture and or more Kurdish-centric things would begin to be formed through Turkey's political Kurds. These leftist Kurds would then create their own leftist Kurdish movements that at times would separate from the Turkish far-left movements. These new leftist Kurdish groups were aimed at addressing social and political issues that Kurds specifically faced within Turkey. And of course, these groups all didn't have the same idea. Some of these groups supported Kurdish independence, some of these groups supported Kurdish autonomy, some of these Kurds just wanted to see more rights be granted to Kurds within Turkey, some of these political Kurds wanted an armed revolution, some of these political Kurds would want it to be non-violent. Because like I stressed in the first video, Kurds are not a monolithic group. And what I should stress in this video now is that Kurdish independence and autonomy and just the Kurdish struggle does not have one monolithic group or viewpoint. By 1975, peaceful protester that was later radicalized in a Turkish jail, Abdullah Öcalan, would begin to form his own base of supporters that felt that the current political process in Turkey was a sham and that any real change, and for this case Kurds, could only come when the system is smashed, and if need be, through armed revolution. During this time, Abdullah Öcalan and his band of supporters would begin to hold lectures within southern Turkey, you know, in the Kurdish populated areas, calling for Kurdish self-determination. Abdullah Öcalan's group at time would debate and physically fight with Turkish and Kurdish leftists over the ideas of 
courteous self-determination, you know, should there be an armed struggle, and many more complex inner Kurdish and leftist arguments and movements and talking points. This isn't to say that Abdullah Öcalan's group did not fight the Turkish far-right nationalist groups. They did. They did not like the Turkish far-right at all. Now, Abdullah Öcalan's views were seen as something extreme within many of these leftist and Kurdish leftist movements. Along with getting into debates and physical fights with other Kurdish and leftist movements, Abdullah Öcalan's group would find themselves being shunned by other Kurdish and leftist groups. Even with, for the most part, a mutual alienization and hostility towards other groups and Abdullah Öcalan's group, his group would only continue to grow. As just like with any successful YouTube channel, Abdullah Öcalan was doing something new and unique which was his message of accepting Kurdish culture, which wasn't completely unique at that time, but the other part was, and it was through armed revolution. And as the ensuing Turkish governments began crackdowns in the late 70s against Kurdish movements, Abdullah Öcalan's group would only continue to gain more support. The bigger his group got though would lead to more conflicts with the leftist, Turkish, and Kurdish, you know, political groups, and of course the far-right Turkish groups. Heck, Abdullah Öcalan's group would even come into armed conflict against the more traditional and conservative Kurdish landowners called Agas. Now, these Agas tended to view the Kurdish leftist movements from these urban cities as a new group that was threatening certain aspects of Kurdish culture, and that these groups were now forcing their way into intertribal Kurdish politics. I should also state that some of these Agas were aligned with far-right Turkish groups, so I'm sure that also played into it. Now, one of the more bolder moves done by Abdullah Öcalan's group was the assassination attempt of Mehmet Silal, who was a Kurdish Aga, a parliamentarian, and a member of the National Action Party. Now, while this assassination attempt did fail, this was still a sign of strength for Abdullah Öcalan's group, as it showed that his group could attack the state whenever they wanted to. At this time, too, leaflets were dropped around southern Turkey with the proclamation of the Partiya Karkarin Kurdistan, also known as the People's Party of Kurdistan, also known as the PKK. Now this brand new spanking PKK group would revolve around the ideas of Kurdish separatism through a Marxist-Leninist viewpoint. Now while this was the official declaration of the PKK group, the PKK group was originally made eight months earlier in a Kurdish village. But if you want to start something, you might as well start it with a bang. The PKK group following the assassination attempt on Mehmet Tilal would now find themselves on the back foot, disliked by everybody from the far right to the far left, they now had the state looking for them. During this time you'd also hear rumors about another Turkish military coup in the making. Abdullah Öcalan would then find himself moving house to house with no area to set up base. Abdullah Öcalan would also see the writing on the wall of continued Turkish government crackdowns and a rumor of a military coup. Abdullah Öcalan would flee to Syria where he would call for his supporters and members to then reorganize in Syria. In 1980, the Turkish military would lead another coup in the name of halting political violence. Because the best way to stop more political violence that just came out of another coup trying to stop more political violence is to do another coup. Within this coup, you'd begin to see crackdowns against political groups within Turkey with the aim of ending, you know, the political violence in Turkey. The country would be placed under martial law. At one point, the parliament would be abolished and the constitution would be rewritten. Mass arrest would begin. Torture and executions would then begin against political opponents to the military rule. Let's just say at this time, Turkey had a lot of human rights abuses. You would also see the rebanning of Kurdish language and culture and many opposition to the military rule was silence. And during this time, the PKK would give orders to PKK members to flee into Syria where they could regroup and rearm for a new armed struggle. In Syria, Abdullah Öcalan didn't just sit around. Either in early 1979 or 1980, Abdullah Öcalan would spend his time in Syria trying to form connection with other groups like the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine called the DFLP he would also make connections with the Palestinian Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine called the PFLP and he would also make connections with Lebanese communists. Abdullah Öcalan, a very talkative guy and convincing guy, would be able to convince these groups to train his band of PKK guerrillas in guerrilla warfare. Because for those that don't know, learning how to shoot and maneuver while making an IED takes a lot of time. And, at times, these PKK fighters were used to fight Israel when Israeli forces were raiding Palestinian camps while these PKK members were there. 
I think I should say that these Palestinian camps were in Lebanon, and the Syrian government allowed this to happen. Some of you might realize something from the last video. Syria has a sizable Kurdish population. And despite what your buddy with a Bashar al-Assad profile picture says, Syria, under the Assads, was and still is a brutal dictatorship that silences any opposition towards them. So the million dollar question would be, why would this dictatorship allow a bunch of Kurdish fighters from Turkey to enter their country and train in warfare under the ideas of Kurdish self-determination and separatism while having their own oppressed Kurdish minority? Heck, in part 1 of the video, we talked about how the Syrian Arab government would strip massive parts of the Kurdish population of their Syrian citizenship. Well, you see, Syria allowed, or at the very least, tolerated these PKK fighters, and we can't forget the Iraqi PUK, because the Syrian government disliked the Turkish and Iraqi governments at this time, and wanted to use the PKK and PUKs as proxies against them. On the other side of this unwritten deal, was that the PKK, really wouldn't try to inspire Kurds within Syria because Syria was their current basis of operation and if you kind of anger the Syrian government, they will clamp down on the group and where are you going to organize yourselves now? Abdullah Ajalan would work on improving his relationship with other Kurdish groups that he previously insulted to put it lightly, especially those in Iraq. Why? Well that's because the PKK would need a jumping ground to attack Turkey and the Syrian government wasn't willing to be that spot. Syria had no problems housing the PKK and allowing them to use their training camps in Lebanon, but they would not allow the PKK to attack Turkey directly from Syria. This would lead to the Iraqi Kurdish KDP and the Turkish Kurdish PKK to reach an agreement and the PKK would begin to set up their own bases within KDP territory, where the PKK would then train in mountain warfare. This isn't to say that all went well in Syria or within the PKK. During this time, multiple Kurdish and leftist groups would also flee into Syria, but these groups would fall into infighting over ideological disputes. These groups would also be surprised that they didn't have the popular support in Turkey that they expected, and some of these groups didn't even like the idea of an armed struggle. During this time, uh, some groups would begin to give up on the idea of revolution, feeling that Turkey just wasn't ready for it for the time being. The PKK would also suffer from its own internal problems. Throughout 1982 to 1983, many Turkish Kurdish and far left Turkish groups in Syria would begin to splinter. They would move to Europe or they would dissolve. To put it very frankly, many of these groups weren't ready for this armed struggle, nor did some of these groups expect an armed struggle. One group that did expect an armed struggle was Abdullah Ocalan's PKK. This isn't to say that the PKK got through all of their issues just because they were always talking about armed struggle. The PKK just didn't have room for internal divisions and the PKK would begin to clamp down on its own dissidents at times killing them and at times scaring members away that tended to disagree with Abdullah Ocalan's view on how to proceed with the Kurdish struggle. During this time, the PKK would begin to form a cult of personality around Abdullah Ocalan, aka Apple, which is short for Abdullah but also means the uncle. By 1984, the PKK was ready for its armed struggle in southern Turkey, also known as Baktur North. And if anyone gets mad that I call it southern Turkey or Baktur North, I will start calling it Free Dairy, damn it. Now the PKK would begin to cross into Iraq and then from Iraq into southern Turkey. The PKK's goal was to stir the pot of disenfranchised Kurdish youth into a pot of armed Kurdish revolutionaries. It would start off by killing Kurds that were seen as government loyalists, spies, and actors, but I think we're all here for the more confronting attacks against the state. And this would be at the cities of this place and that place I'm not even going to try to butcher. And in the case of this city, the PKK would actually raid the local military barracks while handing out propaganda to people within the city. Now the attack on these cities had multiple goals, other than just being a military action against the Turkish state. These attacks were also PR for the PKK, as they wanted to show to the Kurdish population that this Kurdish war of liberation was beginning and that the PKK's rebellion was effective unlike previous Kurdish rebellions within Turkey. The PKK would begin to strike and attack Turkish troops, bases, and other military installations within southern Turkey, which would surprise the Turkish state as the state wasn't ready for a insurgency and the military had just stepped down 8 months ago and allowed democratic rule back into Turkey. These attacks would gain the attention of support of many Kurds within southern Turkey, as many Kurds still felt disenfranchised by Turkish government policies 
their language and culture was still denied like a certain genocide. That of course would play into resentment against the Turkish state within the Kurdish population and this would be a great recruitment piece for the PKK. During the 1980s, the PKK would be able to build networks within Turkish prisons. Remember that military coup? That coup would arrest a lot of leftists and leftist Kurds and just Kurds in general. And as this insurgency went on from a leftist Kurdish group, it wouldn't take Einstein to see all the dots connecting, especially when Turkey began to mass arrest a lot more leftists and Kurds. Many Kurdish nationalists and leftists would then begin to organize within these jails. On top of that, Turkish prisons were known as places of torture against prisoners, especially Kurds, so that of course played once again into the PKK. By 1985, southern Turkey would become a battleground between a more prepared Turkish military and an energized PKK. Now the PKK in northern Iraq for the most part was ignored by the Iraqi government and by Iraqi Kurdish groups until Turkey began to lead airstrikes and then later on anti-PKK operations in northern Iraq which would then place extreme pressure on both the Iraqi and Iraqi Kurdish groups. And as the war continued, the PKK would see another inner purge where Abdullah Hoxhlan was able to be established as the main leader of the PKK with almost no room of you know disagreement. Now as the war went on, the war, no surprise here, would become more brutal between the PKK and Turkey. And during this time, Turkey would begin to instate pro-Turkey Kurdish militia members called the Village Guards. And as the conflict continued, many Village Guards would be killed but also members of their family would be killed by the PKK. Okay, you would have events like the Pinikchar Massacre. The PKK at times would target symbols of the Turkish state like Turkish schools and clinics. The PKK would also enact a highly controversial event, even highly controversial within the group, which called for a military draft of the Kurdish population. They would just kidnap people into the PKK and force them to fight against the Turkish military. It's safe to say by the late 1980s, the PKK was a controversial subject within Turkey. Some Kurds saw the PKK as a violent group that killed civilians and conducted kidnappings of young Kurdish men who forced them to fight against Turkey where they would die. Other Kurds would view the PKK as a group that fought for the oppressed Kurdish population against the Turkish government that had a long history of oppressing and killing Kurds. I mean, at the time, we were seeing mass arrests and tortures of Kurdish political prisoners, along with reports of executions. And when members within Turkey's parliament, especially Kurdish ones, would criticize Turkish government policy towards the Kurdish population, they would at times find themselves being shouted at, spat at, and isolated from their own political parties and just isolated from the general Turkish political sphere. During this time, any protests that gave a whiff of Kurdish culture or Kurdish separatism would be put down by the state and vague anti-terror laws would be used to arrest anyone who raised issue with Turkey's execution of its counterinsurgency. This would only drive more Kurds to join the PKK. Now, you know what else was happening in the 80s? The Iran-Iraq War. And for those that don't know what happened in the Iran-Iraq War, watch part one. But if you're not, then let me give you a general oversimplification. The Iraqi Kurdish groups would find themselves being attacked by Saddam Hussein's Iraq after they gained a whole bunch of land during the Iran-Iraq War. Now, while this war was going on between Iran and Iraq and these Iraqi Kurdish groups, the PKK was able to form a mutual neutrality in northern Iraq with the Iraqi government. When Iraqi Kurdish groups began to fall to Saddam Hussein's onslaught, the PKK was left untouched, for the most part. Now I should state that in 1989, Abdullah Öcalan would declare that the PKK attacks on the civilian populations were mistakes and that they should and will be halted. While in 1990, the PKK would vote on ending its drafting of young Kurdish men as these two subjects were hurting PKK's morale and PR. I should also state this group would have another purge due to an influx of new fighters and a paranoia of spies. And I feel like I should state that the PKK's purges would then end when the Lohar Jalan would declare that purges and attacks against the civilian population weren't ordered by him but were committed by overzealous, a renegade or incompetent PKK commanders where these commanders were then placed on trial and killed via a firing squad. Purges would still continue within the group into 1995 and civilians would still be killed as the war went on. Now, Abdullah Ojalan did have control of what the PKK did. 
In my opinion, it's highly unlikely that Abdullah Ojalan did not know about the purges that happened and the highly controversial killing of civilians. On the Turkish side of the war, it was very simple. Turkey had no big separatist issue with its Kurdish population. What's that? These are mountain Turks. But just in case no one got the message, Turkey would begin to ban newspapers and things of that sort that would go against official government views on this Kurdish separatist insurgency. During his time, mass arrests, tortures, and killings would begin against Turkey's political Kurds that were protesting the government's crackdown. By 1919, southern Turkey, or Baktur North, or Frideri, or whatever the hell you want to call it, would see massive popular Kurdish uprisings, protests, and rioting with the Turkish police. Now these things were called, sorry for my butchering, they were called the, the Serheldin. The start of the Serheldin would begin within the cities of Nusaybin, where a funeral procession of a slain PKK fighter was held. With emotions high, mourners and the Turkish government would begin to clash. And during these clashes, gunfire would break out, wounding many mourners, kicking off more clashes that would last into the night even after a curfew was declared on the city. The cities of Nusaybin and Jizra would see clashes and protests against Turkey for two weeks. When the dust settled, it showed the PKK and Turkey that the current Turkish counterinsurgency tactics weren't winning the hearts and minds of the Kurdish population. If anything, these Turkish tactics were driving Kurds more towards the PKK. The PKK was also kind of shocked by all the support they had. Now, as the conflict went on, the PKK would suffer from another tiny power struggle. This one between Abdullah Ojalan and Mehmed Sihet Siener. I'm sorry if I butchered any of their names. Now, Mehmed Sihet Siener was a respected PKK member. Now, this Apo Siener split would kind of happen when Siener would challenge the current layout of the group. Siener would question the PKK failures, would place the blame at Abdullah Ojalan. This Apo Siener split would only continue, and later on, Abdullah Ojalan would declare Siener a spy. Siener would end up forming his own band of armed supporters, calling them the PKK Vijin, or PKK Revival. But this brand new group was quickly outdone by Abdullah Ojalan's PKK, and Siener and one of his supporters were found dead in a apartment block within Syria. Abdullah Ojalan would show that the PKK had no room for splits or questionings of his leadership or the group's will. During this time in 1991, the Turkish government would also begin to see shifts within the political scene towards the Kurdish separatist issue and just the general Kurdish problems within Turkey. Within 1991, you would see the creation of the People's Labour Party, which at the start did say it was a party for all of Turkey, but then would later on say that it was a party aimed at giving Kurds rights within Turkey. This is once again my segue into saying that Kurds are not a monolithic group and that how the Kurdish struggle is dealt with, whether it's through armed struggle or through the political process, is once again not a monolithic action. And when Turkey had elections in 1991, the HEP would form an alliance with the SHP, where the HEP was able to enter Turkish parliament due to this alliance they had with the SHP. Turkey also during this time would begin to work on curving the influence of the PKK. Well, the Turkish government would begin to undo the banning of the Kurdish language. Kurds were now allowed to speak their language, but only in private. The Kurdish language still wasn't allowed to be used, you know, in a public sphere or on TV. This isn't to say that the Turkish government was only doing reforms in 1991. More Turkish soldiers were pushed into southern Turkey to fight the PKK. And during this time, you begin to see cases of some Kurdish villages being displaced due to suspected support for the PKK. Many Kurdish politicians within Turkey during this time were really bringing the Kurdish issue to the forefront of the Turkish government. A great example would be Leyla Zena. Leyla Zena was elected to the Grand National Assembly of Turkey. And for those that don't know, when you're elected to the Grand National Assembly of Turkey, you have to, you know, be sworn in. As Leyla Zanal was being sworn in, she would say many of the parts in Turkish, but the final sentence she said in Kurdish, which she said, and I quote, I take this oath for the brotherhood between the Turkish people and the Kurdish people. 
Due to this, many people would then begin to call for her to be arrested. Many people would then begin to look at her as a separatist and as a terrorist. And this wouldn't be the last time Kurdish politicians or Leyla Zenal would kind of run the gauntlet with the Turkish government trying to raise awareness of the Kurdish struggle. That tension within the Turkish government also reflected the tensions within the streets and the mountaintops of Turkey. Or vice versa if you want to say the other way, because you're a weirdo. Southern Turkey would still see bombings committed by the PKK. You would see raidings of isolated Turkish military positions. PKK funerals would become places of clashes and rioting with the police, at times leading to the death of more mourners and then just intensifying these clashes. The PKK-Turkish conflict was only intensifying. The PKK had a way more better understanding of the region and they would use this to move around and to at times outsmart the Turkish military. The Turkish military on the other hand had stronger weapons. The Turkish military, we can't forget, is a NATO ally and had many modern weaponry. So while the PKK could outsmart the Turkish military, the Turkish military could always outgun them. During this time, the Turkish government would begin to work on getting more village guards. As I said before, were pro-Turkey Kurdish folks who would join these pro-Turkey militias. And while the Turkish government was trying to raise the number of village guards, PKK would just begin more campaigns to kill these village guards and other folks that they viewed as state actors and spies. This would at times involve, you know, police, but this would also just involve folks who disliked the PKK and were very public about their disliking of the PKK. During this time, the PKK would even effectively make their own shadow government in southern Turkey. They would enforce their own laws and they would even start taxing things. Now, for the folks that don't know, an armed struggle cost a lot of money. Now how the PKK got its money was through taxing. Now who got taxed was very interesting. And I should state that the PKK did at times, you know, tax the Kurdish population. But a lot of the PKK's taxing and money were building companies that were hired by Turkey, you know, to build roads and buildings and things of that sort within southern Turkey. Building companies would have to pay a tax or just pay off the PKK to not attack them. Another way how the PKK got its money was by taxing smugglers at the Syrian, Turkish, Iranian, and Iraqi borders. For those that don't know, smuggling was very huge within these regions and well, they make a lot of money and the PKK wants some of that. So if you're gonna come through our territory, you better pay us some fines. Another flow of money is highly disputed, but this is the drug trade. Now, let me state that the PKK does deny that they partook in the drug trade. The Turkish government really stresses that the PKK does, you know, do drugs and sell drugs and things of that sort. Now, as I want to leave that highly controversial arguing point for, we're going to move to Iraq. What, you thought this whole video was going to be about the PKK-Turkish conflict? Why don't you get your PKK-Turkish conflict-centric head out of your butt? This is about the Kurdish struggle in the 90s to the modern day. So, check your privileges. Hashtag woke. Now, within Iraq, Saddam Hussein would invade this tiny country called Kuwait in 1991, where he would kick off the first Gulf War, and excuse my French, got his ass handed to him very effectively. Following the defeat of the Gulf War for the Iraqis, Iraq would then see popular uprisings in the Shi'i South and popular Kurdish uprisings in the Kurdish North. And while Saddam Hussein was able to crush the Shi'i Southern uprisings, the Kurdish Northern uprisings were able to hold its ground and the US would establish a no-fly zone over Iraq, effectively ensuring, for the most part, of a Saddam-free northern Iraq under de facto Kurdish control split between the PUK and the KDP. Now the PUK and KDP would end up forming the Kurdistan regional government and the, you know, KRG would see parliamentary elections in 1992 split right between the PUK and the KDP. Now I should state during this time, Iraq would be placed under a UN embargo. And for those that don't know, the KRG, the Kurdistan Regional Government, is still technically a part of Iraq. So the KRG would even be placed under this embargo. But on top of that, Saddam Hussein would place a embargo within the KRG. So for the Kurds in Iraq, they were placed under not just one, but two embargoes. That being said, the KRG still had ways of making money and trading with the outside world and that was trading and smuggling through Turkey. KRG Turkish border would become the only way how the KRG could 
trade and smuggle things out, but things also in. Now things are also pretty layered here, as Iraqi Kurdistan, remember, allowed the PKK to set up bases within their territory and then do attacks off into Turkey. Turkey would, in response, begin to bomb PKK camps and sometimes other Kurdish groups and villages in Iraqi Kurdistan, along with conducting operations against the PKK in northern Iraq at times. This of course would put pressure on the KRG from Turkey. You know, Turkey was the KRG's basic and only trading partner. Turkey was also where American jets flew over northern Iraq to enforce a no-fly zone, you know, that protected Iraqi Kurds from Saddam Hussein. So the Turkish government had a lot of influence over the KRG. Turkey wanted these PKK camps in northern Iraq gone. While it is possible and probably most likely that Turkey dislikes a KRG, a Kurdish regional government on its border, the Turkish government at the very least feels that it could, you know, maintain the issue and deal with it. But here is a KRG that is allowing the PKK to set up bases and attack into Turkish territory, this was something Turkey did not want. Turkey at the time also wanted to spread influence into northern Iraq as a way of you know curbing the influence of the PKK within northern Iraq. Turkey also wanted to show to their own Kurdish population that Turkey had a problem with the PKK and not the Kurds. But the stage being set of the KRG feeling the pressure of Turkey and also allowing the PKK to set up camps and then conduct operations into Turkey and Turkey most likely being very pissed off about that, the stage was being set against the PKK. At first hit for tag killings between PKK fighters and Iraqi Kurdish fighters would break out and before you knew it a conflict would you know break out. And following more death between the PKK and Iraqi Kurdish groups, the PKK would shut down the KRG Turkish trading borders and hubs. For a whole month, the place would be under siege until the PKK lifted its blockade. The PUK and the KDP would both dislike this, as it showed that the PKK had a lot of power in northern Iraq, and also it threatened the economy and the stability of the KRG. The PKK also showed that it wasn't willing to budge from its camps, and wouldn't go out without a fight. These camps were especially important to the PKK as the PKK just lost their training camps in Lebanon once Syria began to shut these camps down. The PKK did not want to lose their camps in northern Iraq as these camps were used now as a place of comfort, organization, and training compared to Turkey which was just a war zone with less areas to relax in. For Iraqi Kurdish groups, especially the PUK and KDP, the PKK was beginning to be seen as a wild card that might destroy this little KRG, and a war would break out between Iraqi Kurdish groups with the support of Turkey against the PKK. The PKK wasn't prepared for the fighting in northern Iraq. Like I said, these camps were used for organizing, relaxing, and training, and things of that sort. Many of the hardcore fighters and warfighters were fighting in Turkey and were not in northern Iraq. The PKK would fight, but they would later on admit defeat and go into negotiations with Iraqi Kurdish groups. The PKK would begin to move its camps and would halt military actions against Turkey via northern Iraq. While for Iraqi Kurdish groups and Turkey, this political relationship and military relationship would not expand any more further than this conflict. The PUK and KDP did not want to become Turkish proxies, especially against other Kurdish groups. This war was also highly unpopular with many Kurds and controversial. Iraqi Kurds would want to distance themselves from this. And on top of that, the KDP and PUK both wanted to maintain a good amount of fighters and ammunition and weaponry, as both the PUK and the KDP were now finding themselves having conflicts between each other. And to show how much Iraqi groups did not want to be seen as a Turkish, you know, proxy or expand its relationship with Turkey to fight against, you know, the PKK, when these operations were over, the PKK in some cases would move back towards their old camps that were shut down, and the PKK would still use northern Iraq to send troops and supplies up into Turkey. Turkey's bid to get rid of the PKK camps in northern Iraq had failed even when they used other Kurds. But Northern Iraq would see a bubbling of something else. And this is where the video will abruptly end. Thank you for watching part 2. I accidentally made the original part 2 an hour long, so I chopped it in half and this is now part 2. Stay tuned for part 3, which will be coming sooner than later to be honest. It might look a little bit like part 2, but hey, 
Tune in next week or in three weeks or in a month, we already know how I upload, to find out will the KRG fall into a civil war? Will Abdullah Ojalan beat Turkey in his armed conflict? Or will Turkey find the Dragon Balls and defeat the Kurdish insurgencies? Tune in next week, three weeks, or a month from now on 